Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're taking a look at a game that has been featured quite extensively on my channel, and that is because 206 years ago, today, the Battle of Gettysburg came to its climactic uh, conclusion uh, with Pickett's Charge, the, the ill-fated Confederate assault on the Union Center at Gettysburg, uh, which resulted in a... a defeat that the Confederacy could not hide from. Uh, their previous invasion at Antietam in 1862 had ended in a defeat, but it was more of a strategic defeat. Tactically, the Confederates were able to barely hang on to their position on the field and uh, stayed for another day afterwards, so they kind of claimed a victory. Gettysburg, there was no question. The Confederate army was defeated, and that was really because of the conclusive way in which it finished at Pickett's Charge. July 1st was an unquestioned Confederate victory. Uh, there were some uh, positions that the Confederates did not take that would haunt them on July 2nd, but nonetheless they did drive two Union Corps from the field in d some disarray and uh, definitely got the better of the Union forces on July 1st. July 2nd was a near-run thing at times, but the Confederate assaults uh, uh, inevitably or eventually failed to dislodge the Union from their positions along uh, the Cemetery Ridge and uh, the Little Round Top on one anchor and then Culp's Hill on the other anchor of the Union position. And so going into July 3rd, the final day of the battle, the Confederates had had one victorious day and one day that they were defeated but fought well. They, they ravaged a Union Corps in the Peach Orchard and the Wheat Field, um, they really shot to pieces some of the Union forces, uh, but the Union were able to hang on just barely. And as a result, uh, moving into July 3rd, the, the battle was in the, I guess, in, in the balance, if you will. And uh, Pickett's Charge was a decisive repulse for the Confederates, uh, which clearly made the Union position uh, unassailable from the Confederates. They'd used their last strength, they had used the majority of the rest of their artillery, uh, they were in no position to continue the battle. The Union forces were in rough shape as well, uh, but they were nonetheless the victors of the battle. And so on this day, on the 206th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg's conclusion, we are going to fight the Battle of Pickett's Charge, an ultimate general civil war, one of my favorite civil war games of all time. We're going to fight it on Brigadier General difficulty. We're going to fight it with the standard scenario, and we're going to fight it as the Union. So we'll be moving forward here and getting started and just kind of jumping right in. I had the good fortune back in 2017 to be able to uh, travel to Gettysburg for the first time in my life, and it was quite an awe-inspiring experience and, and was quite enjoyable. Uh, I really uh, had a blast and uh, highly recommend visiting. I want to go back. Um, I'm trying to plan either a trip either late this year or, or sort of the spring of next year, either to Gettysburg or potentially Antietam instead. Okay, so we fortified Cemetery Hill so heavily that a frontal assault is not expected. Ah. Uh, the stone wall running along the section of Cemetery Ridge provides excellent cover for our men. The southern section of the ridge is not heavily fortified, but the open ground in front of it can be a death trap for the enemy. And, although it's not advised, we have enough troops on hand to launch a surprise attack and capture their headquarters on Seminary Ridge. This would be enough to claim victory today. General, it is your choice to decide what is best for our army. So you can see here, if we scroll out here, we've got the sort of the, I guess, the, the farm here in the center of the position. We've got the open ground, uh, which the Confederates must advance across. The Confederates have their artillery in position for that historical bombardment. Uh, which was so fierce, but also so ineffective. We've got Hancock in the center here on his horse, uh, you know, saying to his orderly, as he famously did when his orderly asked him to get down, that uh, there are times when a corps commander's life does not count. And uh, there's going to be a bombardment here, and we're just going to kind of have to wait for the enemy assault to come across. So you can see here our artillery in the high ground, uh, some of them in dug in and entrenched positions, Firing back at the Rebels, uh, firing back at Alexander's artillery here, doing quite a bit of damage to his artillery, which is out in the open. Confederates are bringing forward three more artillery batteries here in the center, Jones, Pegram, and McIntosh. 
They also have another battery up here in the north under Dane, which is currently in position. Nelson and Carter are moving their artillery into position. We have Confederate units north of Gettysburg as well, part of Ewell's Corps, which may launch an assault. Now, if we do remember when we deployed our forces, we deployed Howard and we deployed Hancock. We also had Reynolds, which will come up in reserve. I don't know if the battle will extend beyond the current position. Often in Ultimate General Civil War, you get kind of a narrow front in the beginning of these historical fights, and then they expand to include the majority of the army by the end of it. So we'll see. But uh, I guess that time will tell. Meanwhile, we can see the Confederates are coming forward here uh, with their charge. We've got uh, Garnett's Brigade, which is under Pickett. We've got Wilcox Brigade, Posey, uh, the 13th Alabama, Lang Scales, Davis's 11th Mississippi, Archer, Pettigrew, another regiment under Archer, multiple regiments under Archer, or brigades under Archer, uh, Lane and Thomas, and they kind of moved into position as if they were going to attack, and then they fell back. Some of our units aren't doing so great. Obviously, Zook is under artillery fire. His morale is okay, but he's lost 26 casualties. Some of these other infantry units really haven't been the focus of the Confederate attack. The Confederates really have been focusing on our artillery, I think. They're not really doing anything. Our artillery is shooting back and, and doing a good job of getting some kills, but we have lost no men in any of our artillery units yet. Hall's taken a couple of casualties. Webb's taken a couple of casualties. Brooks taken a couple of casualties. Zook's really the only one losing anything of anything. And we've got f like five brigades in his rear that can rush forward and, and hold his position if, uh, if the moment calls for it. The only question is if the rebels decide to move wide left around our left flank. That could be the one vulnerable area because we don't have a lot of infantry down here. So to that extent, we're going to move fully forward to kind of scout this position out. He'll take up some good ground here in this wooded terrain here to the south of Cemetery Ridge. And we'll see if uh, anybody's coming at Tyler's position down here. McGilvery, I want to get him more in the woods. He's not really in good cover at the moment. Fuller is moving into good cover. You know, it'll be interesting to move Fuller way south. There are some rebels here, some artillery. Long range, weak melee, heroic morale, fresh average cover deployed. Okay, so let's move our infantry against this artillery. Let's actually move Standard's Brigade of about 2,000 men and Baxter's Brigade of about 1,100 men. So, oh, actually, don't do that. You're in defensive positions. So we'll just move one of our reserve brigades south to ensure the Confederates, you know, don't don't flank us here. Um, Grzynski and Coster move into those defensive positions. Stone will move into one of them. Carol will move into the other. So redeploying some of our forces here. Fuller, Captain John Fuller was killed. This unit just getting shredded by enemy canister fire. We didn't spot enemy cavalry though. They're gonna, if they get hit by another round of canister, these guys are probably done. But maybe they can break the rebel artillery before uh, oh god no they can't 150 casualties against 28 kills Eshelman's battery which they're attacking is losing some as our artillery turns to focus on them but uh, our own morale is pretty shot let's fall back now Okay, so Eshman's battery is pushed back, actually. Uh, we did drive them from their position. Fuller lost 150 men to really very little purpose. But at least we uh, we pull, we forced him to pull back a little bit. Let's move these guys into this wood line over here. They're recovering some of their morale now that they're out of the, the limelight here. We can see the Confederates are kind of moving their infantry forward just a little bit again. Looks like some of these units have suffered a few casualties. Schlethling Fenning has lost 40 men. Carol's moving into position. Okay, so we've got two lines of troops behind him. Breastworks, and then we've got 
troops down here in the south that are uh, behind stone walls. Standard is swinging way south, so if the rebels do move infantry down there, we should be able to uh, stand against them. Peshelman is pulling out entirely. So that artillery battery, that counter battery fire is doing a good job down there. Meanwhile, some of our artillery is low on ammo. So we're going to swing our ammo wagon north. It should hit up all these different artillery positions and, and get them some supply. It may run out of supply as it moves up that way. But uh, it doesn't look like we have a ton of ammo, which again mirrors history. Historically, the uh, Union artillery, because there was a... Oh, it looks like we destroyed that battery of artillery altogether. Uh, historically, an early shot in the Confederate bombardment at Pickett's Charge took out some of the forward am ammunition caissons was one of the most effective shots and was one of the first shots in the bombardment and um, that meant that the Union had some serious ammunition problems for their artillery and uh, but it also kind of played into the, the Union's hand because it, it prompted the Union to basically order their artillery to conserve their ammo and the, co the commander of the Union artillery did a good job of sort of baiting the, the Confederates into thinking they were being effective and driving off Union batteries when really it was just the Union batteries being very deliberate about holding their fire until the rebels were in, uh, in, in, you know, canister range, if you will, and then opening up on them with devastating effect at that point in time. And yes, I know, sorry uh, to you Confederate fans out there, I do continue to refer to them as the rebels. Because they were indeed rebels. All right, standard. You'll swing south. Use this good terrain over here. You'll kind of anchor the southern end of the line. Meanwhile, our ammunition wagon is out. Looks like we do have one other supply wagon up here, so we'll bring it south. Actually, we have another supply wagon over here. So actually, we'll leave him up here, and we'll move this supply wagon over this way. Meanwhile, the empty wagon will withdraw to the rear. All right, the Confederate infantry is coming forward. I'm going to pull Zook out, move Brook in. So Zook took probably the heaviest hit of any infantry. 160 men lost to the artillery battery. So we're going to swap him out with a fresh brigade. Their morale is still in good shape, but I'd rather have 500 more muskets on the line. So move him in, in the double. At the double. You can see here, uh, Confederate units are moving forward here. They're charging on Brooks, which I think, is this the angle? It looks like there's an angle in the stone wall. So they are kind of converging over here. We'll move two brigades forward as reinforcements. Again, Brook does have the advantage of being behind the stone wall. It gives him a melee and a firepower advantage. We have some artillery under Smith firing into the flank of the advancing Confederates. Brook held firm. Davis's regiment just melted away. You can see there they're getting shot at. Now Lane is at point-blank range. We're going to move Cross into position. So Lane, Brooke was driven back by that volley, that point-blank volley by, by Lane. And now Cross is moving into position here in the stone wall to take up positions to fire back at Lane. Meanwhile, Gleese's men are firing into Lane's flank, and Lane is pulling back just a little bit. Smith is behind and can fire through the position because that's one of the benefits of the fortifications and Lane was routed and driven back. Meanwhile, it looks like there actually are some pretty considerable Confederate forces here on the southern portion of the map. You can see here they may try and flank us. It's a good idea to move Standard over there and fuller further to the left to act at least as a speed bump if we need to react. Brooks engaged in a long-range firefight with Pettigrew's men, which look like they're behind a stone or a fence of their own. So both Pettigrew and Brooks' troops are uh, in good defensive terrain. Meanwhile, Archer's brigade here is nearly destroyed. 121 men. I guess this is a regiment. It's weird. Some of the units are regiments. Some of them are brigades, but that one just got routed from the field. Wolford's trying to come in on the flank. We're going to move Webb and Hall forward to flank the flankers. And uh, if Brook is shifting his fire to Wolford, who's out in the open, too. 
Alright, so Hall and Webb have now extended the front here on, along the stone wall. Which does commit our reserves a little bit. You can see the Confederates are still converging on the angle. We've got Garnet's troops moving up a bit. Looks like there's another charge coming in. This one against Cross. Brook has been driven back, and so Zook will rush back into his old position. Willard will move forward as well. Brooks going to move forward as a second reserve for the stone wall. We'll see if Cross holds his position. If Cross doesn't, we do have Smith right there in the rear. And again, we've got Smith's battery of artillery firing canister into Lane, who has now been driven back, showing his back to the Yan to the Yankees, and uh, getting hit in the rear with with fresh volleys. Playing a Brigadier level difficulty, which is the medium level difficulty, I guess it would have been a more interesting challenge to play this battle as the Confederates, where the challenge is obviously much greater, assaulting across open ground against Duggan troops. But given the Union did win the battle, I did think it was uh, it was be more of an interesting challenge, or not challenge, but just interesting to display the battle from the defender's point of view. Especially since, you know, today is... Uh, July 3rd, the anniversary of the battle. It's kind of the verge of Independence Day. Okay. Hancock hanging strong there. Kemper being driven back. No real assault on the northern end of the line yet. We'll see if Hill's boys come out to play at all. Got an hour and 25 minutes of game time, not actual real time, but in terms of the game's countdown timer left. And the Confederates are, to this point, melting away pretty strongly, just like they did historically. We not had the opportunity to hit them in the flank yet. Historically, there was a regiment of Union troops that came forward and flanked the attackers. Alright, another melee here across his men. Their morale is dropping. They hung in there just barely and destroyed that Confederate uh, brigade. It was routed from the field. You can see the flag disappears in this game when, an, when a unit is essentially destroyed for good. Kelly's brigade doing a good job. Unsung heroes. We've barely mentioned them to this point. 468 kills for only 124 deaths. They're adjacent to the angle. We've got Lane coming in, charging here again. Kemper charging Gleese's men. Gleese's men have hung in there pretty remarkably well as well. Okay. Armistead's boys. Armistead, the Confederate general who made it the furthest at the battle, of, or at the engagement at Pickett's Charge. Actually, when I was there in 2017, they had a tombstone that marked where Armistead got to and uh, had some Confederate flags on the tombstone. Okay, lanes routed and being driven back. I kind of think for the Confederates in this particular fight, not historically because the game doesn't represent like things like fences and other things that the Confederates historically had to clear, but I think the game, if it wanted to represent if the Confederates want to win this battle, I think they need to do more than just charge one unit at a time. I think they need to do multiple melees all sort of simultaneously and just overwhelm the defenders. Saying the Confederates have secured Cemetery Ridge, I don't buy it. Cross's brigade is being driven back. We're going to rush Smith's men in there. Wilcox did break through, but Wilcox is being driven back himself. We've got this reserve brigade coming forward out of this crop of trees. Smith is now in the defensive position, meleeing with Wilcox, who's retreating. Then Smith is probably going to fire a volley into Wilcox's rear to make sure that they keep running. Scales is coming forward to replace Wilcox. This does represent the, uh, the way that Pickett's Charge is portrayed in the movie Gettysburg, which is not perfect from a historical point of view, but from a just a, you know, Civil War buff watching it, has some interesting 
components to it. And I think does an, it does a pretty good job of replicating or showing Pickett's charge. And um, you get the sense at one point where Armistead's brigade is coming forward and he breaks through the first line almost like where Cross is being driven back, almost just like that. Um, and you get the sense of they're breaking through the front line, but then immediately a mass of Union reinforcements charge into their position from this wooded terrain just a little bit to the rear. Kind of exactly like what happened where he pushed Cross's brigade back and Cross started running. The Confederates were moving forward and instantly Smith's brigade came forward, counter volleyed and charged and broke the Confederates in a split second. Kelly's brigade me while well, hanging on there, they're losing some pretty heavy casualties. But uh, they're holding their position gamely. We're going to move Willard over a little bit because Kelly's probably going to... If he's not routed because his morale's still pretty high, he may just get destroyed. Meanwhile, Webb's uh, got an opportunity to come forward and flank the Rebels, so we're going to do that. Hall's going to advance to try and secure Webb's flank. And we're going to have standard advance on the Rebel forces over in this direction. Brooke will move forward a little bit. He's lost some casualties, but he's reformed. His morale is back up high. Brooke's morale is pretty good. We'll move him forward a bit. Meanwhile, it looks like actually the Rebels are attacking in the center of our position. They've got a little bit of cover coming in from the town, so there's a bit of a salient here. It's not a very good defensive position. They have driven some of our troops out of that salient. It looks like it was Krasinski's troops. So they're actually having some success here at, at, at Cemetery Hill. And historically, the Confederates had some success there. I think it was on the evening of July 2nd, was it? Where they attacked in twilight, and um, there was a, a salient where the Union position was, and it was night, and they kind of snuck in a little bit, and it was elements of the 1st Corps and the 12th Corps that had really been badly mauled the day before. They were not in good, good shape to repulse the enemy. And uh, the Confederates made a lodgment, but they didn't have sufficient troops to uh, support the attack. And so they kind of got almost like we are right here, where they dislodged the front, the front Union regiment. It was night. It was confusing. But they didn't have those follow-on forces to exploit the uh, the advantage that they had uh, that they had gained. Okay. Meanwhile, Kelly's forces hanging in there to 248 men. They've inflicted almost a thousand casualties, but they've lost more than half their strength. Uh, meanwhile, Smith's brigade is getting chewed up here. Lane and Pettigrew both charging. So Smith's about to be in some pretty heavy melee. There's another battery of artillery here, Smith's Artillery, which has also inflicted about a thousand casualties on the enemy. You can see here we're losing Cemetery Ridge. Two more brigades, Scales and Pettigrew coming forward, Lane driven back. Volleys from Gleesa, Ames, Cross, Brook, all playing their role in routing Pettigrew and driving him back. Scales is still fighting gamely, he is not routed, he's not retreated yet. Smith also might retreat. Well, no, looks like Scales is going to retreat first. Okay, so they really take, when they start running, they take huge casualties as they get shot in the rear. Union resecure Cemetery Ridge. Meanwhile, Stannard's Brigade is advanced against Wright's Brigade in the south here. It's driven back. We don't have much infantry. We've got Webb's brigade over here, which has fought and suffered some casualties. Apparently retreated to the south on, uh, I don't even know what this is, South Cemetery Ridge. But we've got so much artillery here and good terrain that hopefully the rebels aren't able to effectively approach us over there. Meanwhile, Armistead being driven back there. I think he's lost about 50% casualties. Kemper's still fighting on gamely. A major effort from Hill coming here on Cemetery Hill. This seems like the best place on the map, as I've sort of already discussed. Historically, it was. But it seems like the best place on the map for the uh, Confederates to make a push if they're going to have any real success. Also, these are elements of Howard's Corps, which are a little bit less experienced, not quite as reliable. The battle only has about 10 minutes left, according to the timer. But you can extend if if there's a position on the map that is in play 
or if the enemy still has substantial strength and is making certain maneuvers, the game will typically extend beyond the time limit. So if they charge forward with Pettigrew and start to threaten Cemetery Ridge, the game will extend to a longer time. You can see Garnet coming forward here again. Not much hope of success for him. They might well, they might, they very may well destroy Kelly's forward brigade. But I think that's about all they can, there goes Hancock retreating a little bit. But I think that's probably about the best they can hope for here is that Kelly's brigade is just going to evaporate under the pressure. But there goes Garnett. His own brigade evaporates first. Kelly's heroes right now. That's the way this battle's unfolding. Okay, in the north, still holding our position against these masses of Confederates, kind of pressing toward Culp's Hill. We do have the second line of troops here. Stone's brigade is dug in. Uh, we've also got Krasinski over here. His troops aren't dug in, but reasonable cover. They've got Paul's brigade, which is dug into their left. And there you go. The battle ends on time with a Union victory. Uh, Pickett's charge. I don't know why it says July 1st. It was definitely July 3rd. 25,000 Union troops against 30,000 Confederates. 200 guns versus 182. The Union lose 4,242 men, 6 guns, 167 gunners. The Confederates lose 14,106 men, 37 guns, crewed by 924 men. No missing, no cavalry casualties. Longstreet and Hill repulsed by Robert Tyler, John Reynolds. He was already dead. Winfield Scott Hancock and Oliver Howard. Goals, we achieved them all. Uh, the only thing we didn't do is we didn't counterattack and take South Cemetery Ridge. It's weird that that would be considered a draw. I guess if we hold Cemetery Seminary Ridge but lose less than 55% of our army, it would be a draw, which is weird because that would assume we evacuate our starting positions. Um, Smith's Brigade that we talked about there inflicted 1,599 casualties versus 330 losses. They inflicted the most damage of any other unit, but we had several other units with 1,000 plus. Smith's Artillery Battery, different spelling of Smith, 1,131 with only 131 losses. Smith, another Smith. There's just so many Smiths. I guess it's Smythe up here. Then Smith, and then Smith's Infantry Brigade, 1,383 kills. Or sorry, 1,038 kills. This unit had 1,383 men. Kelly's uh, Infantry, Kelly's Heroes, as we talked about, they lost 532 of their some hun about 700 men. Uh, inflicted over 1,000 casualties. They inflicted more casualties than existed in their unit at the start of the battle. Um, and uh, they... Uh, lost about 360. So those are the the top killers. Uh, Sleffling, Flenning, uh, 1,022. Gleesa, 986. Zook, 930. Koster, 800. Cross, 772. Brook, 768. And Taft, 450. In terms of losses, uh, several units didn't lose anything. Several Confederate artillery batteries didn't lose anything. And then Gordon's Infantry Brigade didn't even engage. But in terms of the most loss, they are all Confederate Pettigrew lost 1,188 men out of a total of 1,557. Um, that's a staggering percentage there. Um, or sorry, that was Lane. Pettigrew lost uh, 1,074 out of 2,300. Armistead lost 1,013 out of 1,755. I barely even saw Armistead. He must have gotten chewed up so quickly. Man, what's the top kill unit for the Confederates? Alexander's artillery, 412 kills. They actually killed more than they lost. And then Lane's battery, 358. All the Confederate top, the two Confederate tops were uh, artillery. Ramisar's brigade, 197 kills, only one loss. It must have been behind a unit or something like that. Anyway, victory for us there. Several officers promoted, not that it matters in an individual battle scenario. Uh, a bunch of weapons seized. Again, that only matters in a campaign mode. So yeah, I think that'll do it for this episode. Uh, looking at uh, Ultimate General Civil War, which we haven't played in quite some time. The Battle of Pickett's Charge, a sub-scenario of the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, Ultimate uh, Admiral Age of Sail actually just entered uh, early access. You do have to purchase it directly through the Game Labs uh, website. But that's the next game in the Ultimate series. So they did Ultimate General Gettysburg, and then they did Ultimate General Civil War, which is what you're looking at now. And uh, they're working on and about to release Ultimate Admiral Age of Sail, which brings us to Napoleonic time frame. 
and then uh, Ultimate uh, Admiral Dreadnoughts, which will be more of a World War One type naval combat and design game, very similar to Rule the Waves. Um, so those are some interesting upcoming games from Game Labs. But I think that'll do it for today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you guys are going to have, you know, if you're in America, if you're an American, you celebrate the 4th of July. I hope you guys have a great 4th of July uh, tomorrow. And uh, today, just give a few minutes to remember those who fell at Gettysburg. Uh, today, the conclusion, the anniversary of the conclusion of the Battle of Gettysburg. The bloodiest battle. The bloodiest battle in the American Civil War, I think. Certainly over the three days. I guess not if you include like the Petersburg campaign, but whatever. That's enough of that. Uh, anyway, guys, until next time, as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'm out. <laughs>